Section eight of Cousin Phyllis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Cousin Phyllis by Elizabeth Gaskell. Part four, section two. Sometimes I had seen the minister bring home a letter which he had found lying for him at the little shop that was the post office at Heathbridge, or from the grander establishment at Hornby. Once or twice Josiah, the carter, remembered that the old letter-carrier had trusted him with an epistle to Meester, as they had met in the lanes. I think it must have been about ten days after my arrival at the farm and my talk to Phyllis cutting bread and butter at the kitchen dresser, before the day on which the minister suddenly spoke at the dinner-table and said, "'By the by, I've got a letter in my pocket. Reach me my coat here, Phyllis.' The weather was still sultry, and for coolness and ease the minister was sitting in his shirt-sleeves. I went to Heathbridge about the paper they had sent me, which spoils all the pens, and I called at the post-office and found a letter for me unpaid, and they did not like to trust it to old Ezekiel. Ay, here it is. Now we shall hear some news of Holdsworth. I thought I'd keep it till we were all together." My heart seemed to stop beating, and I hung my head over my plate, not daring to look up. What would come of it now? What was Phyllis doing? How was she looking? a moment of suspense, and then he spoke again. "'Why, what's this? Here are two visiting tickets with his name on, no writing at all. No, it's not his name on both. Mrs. Holdsworth. The young man has gone and got married.' I lifted my head at these words. I could not help looking just for one instant at Phyllis. It seemed to me as if she had been keeping watch over my face and ways. Her face was brilliantly flushed her eyes were dry and glittering. But she did not speak. Her lips were set together almost as if she was pinching them tight to prevent words or sounds coming out. Cousin Holman's face expressed surprise and interest. "'Well!' said she. "'Who'd have thought it? He's made quick work of his wooing and wedding. I'm sure I wish him happy. Let me see,' counting on her fingers. October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. At least we're on the twenty-eighth. It is nearly ten months, after all, and reckon a month each way off. Did you know of this news before? said the minister, turning sharp round on me, surprised, I suppose, at my silence, hardly suspicious as yet. I knew. I had heard something. It is to a French-Canadian young lady. I went on, forcing myself to talk. Her name is Ventador. "'Lucille Ventador,' said Phyllis, in a sharp voice out of tune. "'Then you know too!' exclaimed the minister. We both spoke at once. I said, "'I heard of the probability of—' and told Phyllis. She said, "'He is married to Lucille Ventador of French descent, one of a large family near St. Maurice. Am I not right?' I nodded. "'Paul told me. That is all we know, is not it? Did you see the house in's father in Heathbridge?' And she forced herself to talk more than she had done for several days, asking many questions, trying as I could see to keep the conversation off the one raw surface on which to touch was agony. I had less self-command, but I followed her lead. I was not so much absorbed in the conversation but what I could see that the minister was puzzled and uneasy though he seconded Phyllis's efforts to prevent her mother from occurring to the great piece of news, and uttering continual exclamations of wonder and surprise. But with that one exception we were all disturbed out of our natural equanimity, more or less. Every day, every hour, I was reproaching myself more and more for my blundering officiousness. If only I had held my foolish tongue for that one half-hour! If only I had not been in such impatient haste to do something to relieve pain! I could have knocked my stupid head against the wall in my remorse. Yet all I could do now was to second the brave girl in her efforts to conceal her disappointment and keep her maidenly secret. But I thought that dinner would never, never come to an end. I suffered for her even more than for myself. Until now everything which I had heard spoken in that happy household were simple words of true meaning. If we had aught to say, we said it, 
and if any one preferred silence, nay, if all did so, there would have been no spasmodic forced efforts to talk for the sake of talking, or to keep off intrusive thoughts or suspicions. At length we got up from our places and prepared to disperse, but two or three of us had lost our zest and interest in the daily labour. The minister stood looking out of the window in silence, and when he roused himself to go out to the fields where his labourers were working, it was with a sigh, and he tried to avert his troubled face as he passed us on his way to the door. When he had left us I caught sight of Phyllis's face, as thinking herself unobserved, her countenance relaxed for a moment or two into sad, woeful weariness. She started into briskness again when her mother spoke, and hurried away to do some little errand at her bidding. When we two were alone, cousin Holdman recurred to Holdsworth's marriage. She was one of those people who liked to view an event from every side of probability, or even possibility, and she had been cut short from indulging herself in this way during dinner. "'To think of Mr. Holdsworth's being married! I can't get over it, Paul! Not but what he was a very nice young man. I don't like her name, though. It sounds foreign. Say it again, my dear. I hope she'll know how to take care of him English fashion. He is not strong, and if she does not see that things are well aired, I should be afraid of the old cough." He always said he was stronger than he had ever been before after that fever. He might think so, but I have my doubts. He was a very pleasant young man, but he did not stand nursing very well. He got tired of being coddled, as he called it. I hope they'll soon come back to England, and then he'll have a chance for his health. I wonder now if she speaks English. But to be sure, he can speak foreign tongues like anything, as I have heard the minister say." And so we went on for some time, till she became drowsy over her knitting on the sultry summer afternoon, and I stole away for a walk, for I wanted some solitude in which to think over things, and alas to blame myself with poignant stabs of remorse. I lounged lazily as soon as I got to the wood. Here and there the bubbling, brawling brook circled round a great stone, or the root of an old tree, and made a pool. Otherwise it coursed brightly over the gravel and stones. I stood by one of these for more than half an hour, or indeed longer, throwing bits of wood or pebbles into the water, and wondering what I could do to remedy the present state of things. Of course all my meditation was of no use, and at length the distant sound of the horn employed to tell the men far afield to leave off work warned me that it was six o'clock, and time for me to go home. Then I caught wafts of the loud-voiced singing of the evening psalm. As I was crossing the ash-field, I saw the minister at some distance talking to a man. I could not hear what they were saying, but I saw an impatient or dissentient, I could not tell which, gesture on the part of the former, who walked quickly away and was apparently absorbed in his thoughts, for though he passed within twenty yards of me, as both our paths converged towards home, he took no notice of me. We passed the evening in a way which was even worse than dinner-time. The minister was silent, depressed, even irritable. Poor cousin Holman was utterly perplexed by this unusual frame of mind and temper in her husband. She was not well herself, and was suffering from the extreme and sultry heat, which made her less talkative than usual. Phyllis, usually so reverently tender to her parents, so soft, so gentle, seemed now to take no notice of the unusual state of things, but talked to me to any one, on indifferent subjects, regardless of her father's gravity, of her mother's piteous looks of bewilderment. But once my eyes fell upon her hands, concealed under the table, and I could see the passionate, convulsive manner in which she laced and interlaced her fingers perpetually, wringing them together from time to time, wringing till the compressed flesh became perfectly white. What could I do? I talked with her as I saw she wished. Her grey eyes had dark circles round them, and a strange kind of dark light in them. Her cheeks were flushed, but her lips were white and wan. I wondered that others did not read these signs as clearly as I did. But perhaps they did. I think from what came afterwards the minister did. Poor cousin Holman! She worshipped her husband, and the outward signs of his uneasiness were more patent to her simple heart than were her daughter's. After a while she could bear it no longer. She got up, and softly laying her hand on his broad stooping shoulder, she said, "'What is the matter, minister? Has anything gone wrong?' He started as if from a dream. Phyllis hung her head, and caught her breath in terror at the answer she feared. 
but he, looking round with a sweeping glance, turned his broad, wise face up to his anxious wife, and forced a smile, and took her hand in a reassuring manner. "'I am blaming myself, dear. I have been overcome with anger this afternoon. I scarcely knew what I was doing, but I turned away Timothy Cooper. He has killed the ribstone pippin at the corner of the orchard, gone and piled the quicklime for the mortar for the new stable-wall against the trunk of the tree. Stupid fellow! Killed the tree outright, and it loaded with apples." "'And ribstone pippins are so scarce,' said sympathetic cousin Holman. "'Ay, but Timothy is but a half-wit, and he has a wife and children. He had often put me to it sore with his slothful ways, but I had laid it before the Lord, and striven to bear with him. But I will not stand it any longer, it's past my patience, and he has noticed to find another place. Wife, we won't talk more about it." He took her hand gently off his shoulder, touched it with his lips, but relapsed into a silence as profound, if not quite so morose in appearance, as before. I could not tell why, but this bit of talk between her father and mother seemed to take all the factitious spirits out of Phyllis. She did not speak now, but looked out of the open casement at the calm large moon, slowly moving through the twilight sky. Once I thought her eyes were filling with tears, but if so she shook them off, and arose with alacrity when her mother, tired and dispirited, proposed to go to bed immediately after prayers. We all said good-night in our separate ways to the minister, who still sat at the table with the great Bible open before him, not much looking up at any of our salutations, but returning them kindly. But when I, last of all, was on the point of leaving the room, he said, still scarcely looking up, "'Paul, you will oblige me by staying here a few minutes. I would fain have some talk with you.' I knew what was coming all in a moment. I carefully shut to the door, put out my candle, and sat down to my fate. He seemed to find some difficulty in beginning, for if I had not heard what he wanted to speak to me, I should never have guessed it. He seemed so much absorbed in reading a chapter to the end. Suddenly he lifted his head and said, "'It is about that friend of yours, Holdsworth. Paul, have you any reason for thinking he has played tricks upon Phyllis?' I saw that his eyes were blazing with such a fire of anger at the bare idea that I lost all my presence of mind, and only repeated, "'Played tricks on Phyllis?' "'Aye, you know what I mean. Made love to her, courted her, made her think that he loved her, and then gone away and left her. Put it as you will, only give me an answer of some kind or another, a true answer, I mean, and don't repeat my words, Paul.' He was shaking all over as he said this. I did not delay a moment in answering him. I do not believe that Edward Holdsworth ever played tricks on Phyllis, ever made love to her. He never, to my knowledge, made her believe that he loved her. I stopped. I wanted to nerve up my courage for a confession, yet I wished to save the secret of Phyllis's love for Holdsworth as much as I could, that secret which she had so striven to keep sacred and safe, and I had need of some reflection before I went on with what I had to say. He began again before I had quite arranged my manner of speech. It was almost as if to himself. "'She is my only child, my little daughter. She is hardly out of childhood. I have thought to gather her under my wings for years to come. Her mother and I would lay down our lives to keep her from harm and grief.' Then, raising his voice and looking at me, he said, "'Something has gone wrong with the child, and it seems to me to date from the time she heard of that marriage. It is hard to think that you may know more of her secret cares and sorrows than I do. But perhaps you do, Paul, perhaps you do. Only if it be not a sin, tell me what I can do to make her happy again. Tell me." "'It will not do much good, I am afraid,' said I. But I will own how wrong I did. I don't mean wrong in the way of sin, but in the way of judgment. Holdsworth told me just before he went that he loved Phyllis, and hoped to make her his wife. And I told her. There. It was out. All my part in it, at least. And I set my lips tight together, and waited for the words to come. I did not see his face. I looked straight at the wall opposite, but I heard him once begin to speak, and then turn over the leaves in his book before him. How awfully still that room was! The air outside, how still it was! The open windows let in no rustle of leaves, no twitter or movement of birds, no sound whatever the clock on the stairs, 
the minister's hard breathing. Was it to go on for ever? Impatient beyond bearing at the deep quiet, I spoke again. I did it for the best as I thought. The minister shut the book too hastily and stood up. Then I saw how angry he was. For the best, do you say? It was best, was it, to go and tell a young girl what you never told a word of to her parents, who trusted you like a son of their own? He began walking about, up and down the room close under the open windows, churning up his bitter thoughts of me. "'To put such thoughts into the child's head,' continued he, "'to spoil her peaceful maidenhood with talk about another man's love, and such love, too!' He spoke scornfully now. "'A love that is ready for any young woman! Oh, the misery in my poor little daughter's face to-day at dinner! The misery, Paul! I thought you were the one to be trusted, your father's son, too, to go and put such thoughts into the child's mind, you two talking together about that man wishing to marry her." I could not help remembering the pinafore, the childish garment which Phyllis wore so long, as if her parents were unaware of her progress towards womanhood. Just in the same way the minister spoke and thought of her now as a child, whose innocent peace I had spoiled by vain and foolish talk. I knew that the truth was different, though I could hardly have told it now. But indeed I never thought of trying to tell it. It was far from my mind to add one iota to the sorrow which I had caused. The minister went on walking, occasionally stopping to move things on the table or articles of furniture, in a sharp, impatient, meaningless way. Then he began again. "'So young, so pure from the world! How could you go and talk to such a child, raising hopes, exciting feelings, all to end thus, and best so, even though I saw her poor, piteous face look as it did? I can't forgive you, Paul. It was more than wrong, it was wicked, to go and repeat that man's words." His back was now to the door, and in listening to his low, angry tones, he did not hear it slowly open, nor did he see Phyllis, standing just within the room until he turned round. Then he stood still. She must have been half undressed, but she had covered herself with a dark winter cloak, which fell in long folds to her white, naked, noiseless feet. Her face was strangely pale her eyes heavy in the black circles round them. She came up to the table very slowly, and leant her hand upon it, saying mournfully, "'Father, you must not blame Paul. I could not help hearing a great deal of what you were saying. He did tell me, and perhaps it would have been wiser not, dear Paul. But, oh dear, oh dear, I am so sick with shame! He told me out of his kind heart, because he saw— that I was so very unhappy at his going away." She hung her head, and leant more heavily than before on her supporting hand. "'I don't understand,' said her father, but he was beginning to understand. Phyllis did not answer till he asked her again. I could have struck him now for his cruelty, but then I knew all. "'I loved him, father,' she said at length, raising her eyes to the minister's face. "'Had he ever spoken of love to you?' Paul says not." Never. She let fall her eyes, and drooped more than ever. I almost thought she would fall. "'I could not have believed it,' said he in a hard voice, yet sighing the moment he had spoken. A dead silence for a moment. "'Paul, I was unjust to you. You deserved blame, but not all that I said.' Then again a silence. I thought I saw Phyllis's white lips moving, but it might have been the flickering of the candlelight. A moth had flown in through the open casement and was fluttering round the flame. I might have saved it, but I did not care to do so. My heart was too full of other things. At any rate no sound was heard for long, endless minutes. Then he said, "'Phyllis, did we not make you happy here? Have we not loved you enough?' She did not seem to understand the drift of this question. She looked up as if bewildered, and her beautiful eyes dilated with a painful, tortured expression. He went on without noticing the look on her face. He did not see it, I am sure. "'And yet you would have left us, left your home, left your father and your mother, and gone away with this stranger wandering over the world.' He suffered too. There were tones of pain in the voice in which she uttered this reproach. Probably the father and daughter were never so far apart in their lives, so unsympathetic. 
yet some new terror came over her, and it was to him she turned for help. A shadow came over her face, and she tottered towards her father, falling down her arms across his knees and moaning out, "'Father! My head! My head!' and then slipped through his quick enfolding arms and lay on the ground at his feet. I shall never forget his sudden look of agony while I live. Never. We raised her up. Her colour had strangely darkened. She was insensible. I ran through the back kitchen to the yard-pump and brought back water. The minister had her on his knees, her head against his breast, almost as though she were a sleeping child. He was trying to rise up with his poor precious burden, but the momentary terror had robbed the strong man of his strength, and he sank back in his chair with a sobbing breath. "'She is not dead. Paul, is she?' he whispered, hoarse as I came near him. I too could not speak, but I pointed to the quivering of the muscles round her mouth. Just then Cousin Holman, attracted by some unwonted sound, came down. I remember I was surprised at the time at her presence of mind, she seemed to know so much better what to do than the minister, in the midst of the sick affright which blanched her countenance, and made her tremble all over. I think now that it was the recollection of what had gone before, the miserable thought that possibly his words had brought on this attack, whatever it might be, that so unmanned the minister. We carried her upstairs, and while the women were putting her to bed, still unconscious, still slightly convulsed, I slipped out, and saddled one of the horses, and rode as fast as the heavy trotting beast could go to Hornby, to find the doctor there, and bring him back. He was out, might be detained the whole night. I remember saying, "'God help us all,' as I sat on my horse, under the window, through which the apprentice's head had appeared to answer my furious tugs at the night-bell. He was a good-natured fellow. He said, "'He may be home in half an hour, there's no knowing, but I dare say he will. I'll send him out to the Hope Farm directly he comes in. It's that good-looking young woman, Holman's daughter, that's ill, isn't it?" Yes. It would be a pity if she was to go. She's an only child, isn't she? I'll get up and smoke a pipe in the surgery, ready for the governor's coming home. I might go to sleep if I went to bed again." Thank you. You're a good fellow. And I rode back almost as quickly as I came. It was a brain fever. The doctor said so when he came in the early summer morning. I believe we had come to know the nature of the illness in the night-watches that had gone before. As to hope of ultimate recovery, or even evil prophecy of the probable end, the cautious doctor would be entrapped into neither. He gave his directions and promised to come again, so soon that this one thing showed his opinion of the gravity of the case. By God's mercy she recovered, but it was a long weary time first. According to the previously made plans, I was to have gone home at the beginning of August but all such ideas were put aside now, without a word being spoken. I really think that I was necessary in the house, and especially necessary to the minister at this time. My father was the last man in the world under such circumstances to expect me home. I say I think I was necessary in the house. Every person—I had almost said every creature, for all the dumb beasts seemed to know and love Phyllis—about the place went grieving and sad, as though a cloud was over the sun. They did their work, each striving to steer clear of the temptation to eye-service, in fulfilment of the trust reposed to them by the minister. For the day after Phyllis had been taken ill, he had called all the men employed on the farm into the empty barn, and there he had entreated their prayers for his only child, and then and there he had told them of his present incapacity for thought about any other thing in this world but his little daughter, lying nigh unto death, and he had asked them to go on with their daily labours as best they could, without his direction. So, as I say, these honest men did their work to the best of their ability, but they slouched along with sad and careful faces, coming one by one in the dim mornings to ask news of the sorrow that overshadowed the house, and receiving Betty's intelligence, always rather darkened by passing through her mind, with slow shakes of the head and a dull wistfulness of sympathy. But, poor fellows, they were hardly fit to be trusted with hasty messages, and here my poor services came in. One time I was to ride hard to Sir William Bentnick's, and petition for ice out of his ice-house, to put on Phyllis's head. Another it was to Eltham I must go, by train, horse anyhow, and bid the doctor there come for a consultation, for fresh symptoms had occurred, which Mr. Brown of Hornby considered unfavourable. Many an hour I have sat on the window-seat, 
halfway up the stairs, close by the old clock, listening in the hot stillness of the house for the sounds in the sick-room. The minister and I met often, but spoke together seldom. He looked so old, so old. He shared the nursing with his wife. The strength that was needed seemed to be given to them both in that day. They required no one else about their child. Every office about her was sacred to them. Even Betty only went into the room for the most necessary purposes. Once I saw Phyllis through the open door. Her pretty golden hair had been cut off long before. Her head was covered with wet cloths, and she was moving it backwards and forwards on the pillow, with weary, never-ending motion, her poor eyes shut, trying in the old accustomed way to croon out a hymn-tune, but perpetually breaking it up into moans of pain. Her mother sat by her, tearless, changing the cloths upon her head with patient solicitude. I did not see the minister at first, but there he was in a dark corner, down upon his knees, his hands clasped together in passionate prayer. Then the door shut, and I saw no more. One day he was wanted, and I had to summon him. Brother Robinson and another minister, hearing of his trial, had come to see him. I told him this upon the stair-landing in a whisper. He was strangely troubled. "'They will want me to lay bare my heart. I cannot do it. Paul, stay with me. They mean well, but as for spiritual help at such a time, it is God only, God only, who can give it." So I went in with him. They were two ministers from the neighbourhood, both older than Ebenezer Holman, but evidently inferior to him in education and worldly position. I thought they looked at me as if I were an intruder, but remembering the minister's words I held my ground, and took up one of poor Phyllis's books, of which I could not read a word, to have an ostensible occupation. Presently I was asked to engage in prayer, and we all knelt down, Brother Robinson leading and quoting largely as I remember from the book of Job. He seemed to take for his text, if texts are ever taken for prayers. Behold, thou hast instructed many, but now it has come upon thee, and thou faintest, it touches thee, and thou art troubled. When the others rose up, the minister continued for some minutes on his knees. Then he too got up, and stood facing us, for a moment before we sat down again in conclave. After a pause, Robinson began. "'We grieve for you, Brother Holman, for your trouble is great. But we fain have you remember you are as light set on a hill, and the congregations are looking at you with watchful eyes. We have been talking as we came along on the two duties required of you in this strait, Brother Hodgson and me, and we have resolved to showing forth an example of resignation.' Poor Mr. Holman visibly winced at this word. I could fancy how he had tossed aside such brotherly preachings in his happier moments, but now his whole system was unstrung, and resignation seemed a term which presupposed that the dreaded misery of losing Phyllis was inevitable. But good, stupid Mr. Robinson went on. "'We hear on all sides that there are scarce any hopes of your child's recovery, and it may be well to bring you to mind of Abraham, and how he was willing to kill his only child when the Lord commanded. Take example by him, Brother Holman. Let us hear what you say.' The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord." There was a pause of expectancy. I verily believe the minister tried to feel it, but he could not. Heart of flesh was too strong, heart of stone he had not. "'I will say it to my God, when he gives me strength, when the day comes,' he spoke at last. The other two looked at each other and shook their heads. I think the reluctance to answer as they wished was not quite unexpected. The minister went on. "'They're a vet,' he said, as if to himself. "'God has given me a great heart for hoping, and I will not look forward beyond the hour.' Then, turning more to them and speaking louder, he added, "'Brethren, God will strengthen me when the time comes, when such resignation as you speak of is needed. Till then I cannot feel it, and what I do not feel I will not express using words as if they were a charm." He was getting chafed, I could see. He had rather put them out by these speeches of his, but after a short time and some more shakes of the head, Robinson began again. "'Secondly, we would have you listen to the voice of the rot, and ask yourself for what sins this trial has been laid upon you, whether you may not have been too much given up to your farm and your cattle, whether this world's learning has not puffed you up to vain conceit and neglect of the things of God whether you have not made an idol of your daughter?' "'I cannot answer. 
I will not answer," exclaimed the minister. My sins I confess to God, but if they were scarlet, and they are so in his sight," he added humbly. I hold with Christ that afflictions are not sent by God in wrath as penalties for sin." "'Is that orthodox, Brother Robinson?' asked the third minister, in a deferential tone of inquiry. Despite the minister's injunction not to leave him, I thought matters were getting so serious that a little homely interruption would be more to the purpose than my continued presence, and I went round to the kitchen to ask for Betty's help. "'Ord, Rotham," said she. They're always a coming in at ill convenient times, and they have such hearty appetites they'll make nothing of what would have served master and you since our poor lass has been ill. I've but a bit of cold beef in the house, but I'll do some ham and eggs, and that'll rote him for worrying the minister. They're a deal quieter after they'd had their victual. Last time as old Robinson came, he was very reprehensible upon master's learning, which he couldn't compass to save his life, so he needn't have been afraid of that temptation and used words long enough to have knocked a body down. But after me and Missus have given him his fill of victual, and he'd had some good ale and a pipe, he spoke just like any other man, and could crack a joke with me." Their visit was the only break in the long, weary days and nights. I do not mean that no other inquiries were made. I believe that all the neighbours hung about the place daily, till they could learn from some outcomer how Phyllis Holman was. But they knew better than to come up to the house for the August weather was so hot that every door and window was kept constantly open, and the least sound outside penetrated all through. I am sure the cocks and hens had a sad time of it, for Betty drove them all into an empty barn and kept them fastened up in the dark for several days, with very little effect as regarded their crowing and clacking. At length came a sleep which was the crisis, and from which she wakened up with a new faint life. Her slumber had lasted many, many hours. We scarcely dared to breathe or move during the time. We had striven for hope so long that we were sick at heart, and durst not trust in the favourable signs, the even breathing, the moistened skin, the slight return of delicate colour into the pale wan lips. I recollect stealing out that evening in the dusk, and wandering down the grassy lane under the shadow of the overarching elms to the little bridge at the foot of the hill, where the lane to the Hope Farm joined another road to Hornby. On the low parapet of that bridge, I found Timothy Cooper, the stupid half-witted labourer, sitting idly throwing bits of mortar into the brook below. He just looked up at me as I came near, but gave me no greeting either by word or gesture. He had generally made some sign of recognition to me, but this time I thought he was sullen at being dismissed. Nevertheless I felt as if it would be a relief to talk a little to some one, and I sat down by him. When I was thinking how to begin, he yawned weariedly. "'You are tired, Tim,' said I. "'Aye,' said he. "'But I reckon I may go home now.' "'Have you been sitting here long?' "'Welly all day long. Leastways since seven in the morning.' "'Why, what in the world have you been doing?' "'Nout.' "'Why have you been sitting here, then?' "'To keep carts off.' He was up now, stretching himself and shaking his lubberly limbs. "'Carts? What carts?' "'Carts is might a wake and yon wench. It's Hornby Market Day. I reckon you're no better than a half-wit yourself.' He cocked his eye at me as if he were gauging my intellect. "'And have you been sitting here all day to keep the lane quiet?' "'Aye, have not else to do. The minister has turned me adrift. Ha' you heard of this lass as fair in to-night?' "'They hope she'll waken better for this long sleep. Good night to you, and God bless you, Timothy,' said I. He scarcely took any notice of my words, as he lumbered across a stile that led to his cottage. Presently I went home to the farm. Phyllis had stirred, had spoken two or three faint words. Her mother was with her, dropping nourishment into her scarce conscious mouth. The rest of the household were summoned to evening prayer for the first time for many days. It was a return to the daily habits of happiness and health. But in these silent days our very lives had been an unspoken prayer. Now we met in the house-place, and looked at each other with strange recognition of the thankfulness on all our faces. We knelt down. We waited for the minister's voice. He did not begin as usual. He could not. He was choking. Presently we heard the strong man sob. Then old John turned round on his knees and said, "'Minister, I reckon we have blessed the Lord with all our souls, 
though we've ne'er talked about it, and maybe he'll not need spoken words this night. God bless us all, and keep our Phyllis safe from harm. Amen." Old John's impromptu prayer was all we had that night. Our Phyllis, as he called her, grew better day by day from that time. Not quickly. I sometimes grew desponding, and feared that she would never be what she had been before. No more she has, in some ways. I seized an early opportunity to tell the minister about Timothy Cooper's unsolicited watch on the bridge during the long summer's day. "'God forgive me,' said the minister. "'I have been too proud in my own conceit. The first steps I take out of this house shall be to Cooper's cottage.' I need hardly say that Timothy was reinstated in his place on the farm, and I have often since admired the patience with which his master tried to teach him how to do the easy work which was henceforward carefully adjusted to his capacity. Phyllis was carried downstairs, and lay for hour after hour quite silent on the great sofa, drawn up under the windows of the house-place. She seemed always the same, gentle, quiet, and sad. Her energy did not return with her bodily strength. It was sometimes pitiful to see her parents' vain endeavours to rouse her to interest. One day the minister brought her a set of blue ribbons, reminding her with a tender smile of a former conversation which she had owned to a love of such feminine vanities. She spoke gratefully to him, but when he was gone she laid them on one side, and languidly shut her eyes. Another time I saw her mother bring her the Latin and Italian books that she had been so fond of before her illness, or rather, before Holdsworth had gone away. That was the worst of all. She turned her face to the wall, and cried as soon as her mother's back was turned. Betty was laying the cloth for the early dinner. Her sharp eyes saw the state of the case. "'Now, Phyllis,' said she, coming up to the sofa, "'we are done all we can for you, and the doctors has done all they can for you, and I think the Lord has done all he can for you, and more than you deserve, too, if you don't do something for yourself. If I were you, I'd rise up and snuff the moon sooner than break your father's and your mother's hearts with watching and waiting till it pleases you to fight your own way back to cheerfulness. There, I never favoured long preachings, and I've had my say." A day or two after Phyllis asked me, when we were alone, if I thought my father and mother would allow her to go and stay with them for a couple of months. She blushed a little as she faltered out her wish, for a change of thought and scene. Only for a short time, Paul. Then we will go back to the peace of the old days. I know we shall. I can, and I will. End of section eight. End of Cousin Phyllis by Elizabeth Gaskell.